Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for the next event in LHSN's Safer Care Accelerator webinar series. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Tim McDonald, the inaugural chair of anesthesiology and medical director of quality and safety at Sidra Medical and Research Center in Doha. His research efforts have focused on the principled approach to patient safety, quality, and medical legal issues related to patient harm. Uh, with an emphasis on robust reporting of patient safety events, near misses, and unsafe conditions. Today, Tim will be uh, describing to us the communication and optimal resolution, or CANDOR process, which is a comprehensive principled approach um, that health systems, institutions, and practitioners can use to respond to um, unexpected patient harm events. So without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to Tim. Thank you so much, Dee Dee. It's a real pleasure. Uh, to be part of this webinar series, and thanks to all of you who have who have logged in, who have an interest um, uh, in in improving care and improving outcomes for our patients um, throughout the world. Um, as Dee Dee mentioned, um, this the talk is about the case for candor, which is an acronym we use in North America without the U in the word candor, which uh, stands for communication and uh, optimal resolution. The, uh, the goal today is to talk about uh, these various elements in a toolkit that's been created in the context of some real cases that have occurred, um, but that flow from uh, the moment the event occurs all the way through until there's been a full resolution uh, for the patients and families, as well as for the institutions when that happens. And it includes uh, issues around event reporting, uh, a safe, uh, just culture, human factors approach to event analysis, um, communication and disclosure skills training and how that fits into this sort of work. Uh, importantly, a tool we'll, we will discuss around care for the caregiver uh, program, which we have found a great deal of interest throughout the globe for a way uh, for all organizations to begin to hardwire and approach to support the care professionals when, when patient harm events do occur. Uh, and then finally, what are the various principles around resolving these cases from the standpoint of the patient's perspective, but also the organization's perspective. Every one of these, all five of these particular areas have a, a very specific tool uh, that is going to be made available in the same way the Team Steps training tools were made available through AHRQ. And the hope is, is that those tools will be available uh, for dissemination through the LHSN uh, in September. Um, beginning for me as as a as an anesthesiologist who also became very engaged in patient safety, um, one of the very first important uh, public um, issues that arose, particularly for those of us who practice anesthesia, occurred over 30 years ago uh, when I was in Boston, beginning to do my pediatric and my anesthesia training. Um, there was a TV show uh, put on by um, ABC uh, called uh, The Deep Sleep. Um, the fact that 6,000 patients die or suffer brain damage every year from carelessness on the part of anesthesiologists. And it was a, it was a huge wake-up call for the profession because until that show came out, there wasn't really much public dialogue at all around preventable. Uh, uh, patient harm. M much of the dialogue at that point was, you know, medicine is dangerous, things happen, um, despite some really good and, and best efforts. However, this TV show pointed out that we had lots of opportunities um, to improve and to change the way we deliver, particularly anesthesia care. So what happened was um, the American Society of Anesthesiologists working with the uh, International Anesthesia Research Society um, throughout the world began to look at these events that had come to the public's knowledge and see if there was uh, much that could be learned from that. And to that end, the AA, there was a committee created. It was the first patient safety committee actually in the world that was created that was initially called the Committee on Patient Safety and Risk Management where they looked at all of the closed legal claims that had led to payouts where the folks involved in the delivery of anesthesia were found to have been wanting in their care. And then a year later, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation was put together and a whole lot of work went into, uh, went into place to try to look at these events and, and what needed to happen. F 
following the review of those closed claims, there was a big team of people who got together to look at, okay, how might we redesign the, the delivery of anesthesia care in a way where we can improve safety and reduce some of these um, unfortunate outcomes. And following that work, um, there was an entire new set of monitoring standards were initiated in 1986, so, which is pretty fast work. When you think about the TV show was in 1982, the committee was put together in 1983 in three short years, new man monitoring standards were put into place um, for the delivery uh, specifically of anesthesia to make it safer. Some of those new standards included, uh, and, and these were big differences between 1983 and 1986, is that in 1986 it became a requirement that we use a pulse oximeter to measure the oxygen in the blood with every heartbeat of every patient under anesthesia. And the other was a device called a cap capnograph, which is a device that measures the exhaled gases of patients who are under anesthesia in a way to make certain that that breathing tube that's in is in the right place. And by making those mandatory in all anesthetics, you can see that the mortality risk for healthy people undergoing anesthesia went from one in 2000 in 1982 to now it's, it's approaching Six Sigma, which is to say, uh, you know, approaching one in a million, are, are you going to have a healthy patient where uh, you're gonna have one of these particularly bad outcomes? Importantly, from the financial and the emotional standpoint, these changes also had a huge uh, impact, and we've demonstrated a substantial reduction in patients and families seeking legal action following unexpected outcomes, which has meant a lot of money as it relates to the liability system, but also the emotional piece um, related to the doctors and nurses who, who now were not involved in harm events who may have been involved in them before. Twelve years later, um, for the rest of healthcare beyond anesthesia, uh, the book entitled To Air as Human came out from the Institute of Medicine that really did shake the, the medical world uh, when it did come out because it, it, it actually uh, put the face in many ways on, on medical air and, and it created a metaphor um, that has been used since that book came out to highlight to the public how much preventable harm does occur every single day in U.S. hospitals. It doesn't look at what may be happening outside of the U.S. It doesn't look at what happens or errors that occur in the outpatient setting. It only looked at what was happening on the hospital side. And the metaphor they used at that time for the number of patients who were dying every single day from preventable medical error was equal to a 747 uh, going down every single day. And, and that was a big wake up call and in, in many ways is what's really pushed a lot of the focus on, on preventable harm and what can we do um, uh, to reduce that. And that's one of the exciting things about being part of LHSN is that there have been many things that have been identified, many tools that have been developed, which we know uh, are beginning to re reduce a lot of the uh, a lot of the preventable harm that's out there. I know in the past, Dr. Pronovost has been heavily involved in, in many of the efforts uh, related to WISH and to LHSN, and, and he, with his team, has been able to demonstrate substantial reductions in infections, particularly in the intensive care unit, by following certain bundles or certain toolkits related to that. And I'm gonna talk to you today about uh, other tools that have been developed that, that begin to create a culture of safety that make uh, the likelihood of error significantly less and our response to it a much more comprehensive and principled way of doing it. Unfortunately, while these events continue to occur in many parts of the world uh, and in many hospitals, there continues to be a wall of silence that exists for a variety of reasons um, that we'll be asking you all about on this, on this webinar uh, related to um, uh, patient harm events and the fact that that there is a tendency for a variety of reasons that when bad things happen, that the communication we should be having with patients and families and with each other uh, doesn't occur in ways that would allow us to learn from these events and to provide the appropriate care and empathy that, 
that 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 should occur. And there's been a lot of data that's come out. This is an article in 2012 in the journal Health Affairs. There's a lot of data to support what Rosemary Gibson included in her book, The Wall of Silence. Uh, this is one from Health Affairs, as you can see, where a survey of, was done of thousands of physicians, asking them whether they are always open and honest with their patients when they have bad news to give or explain a medical error. And unfortunately, this article uh, pointed out that there are many, many numbers of physicians who still are resistant in, in being open and honest with their patients, again, for a variety of reasons. And it just points out the fact that we all know who are involved in, in, in change management and process improvement in these kind of efforts. We know that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast every single morning. And, and so to begin to look at becoming super highly reliable, super safe, we really need to make sure when we're looking within our organizations, how do we embrace, how do we understand, how do we get to some of these issues around uh, the culture of safety uh, and, and what might be there. Because we know that, that bad culture is linked to poor outcomes. Um, we know that disruptive behavior can interfere with the ability of doctors and nurses to take care of their patients all the way through. A culture that lacks standardization is, is not as safe as it could be and, and there's substantially increased risk to those patients who may be in an environment where there is not a standardized, agreed upon best practice approach um, uh, to things that need to be done. So when you look at the Institute of Medicine summary, there were four parts to it. And, and the one that's a big focus on candor is this issue of building a culture of safety. You know, how do we create an environment where patient safety becomes a top priority, where we focus on communication, the human factors approach to harm events, and, and other items all the way through electronic health records, computerized physician order entry, and the team training that goes along with that. And when you, uh, when you ask the question, you know, what is culture? Uh, one of the simplest ways to view it is, is that culture is what people do when no one is looking. And, and I think that's particularly true in healthcare. And, and there's a case in hand, this is a case that happened at the University of Illinois, which is where I was uh, a couple of years ago before moving uh, to the Middle East and taking the position I have and I'm honored to have here in Doha. Uh, but it involves a case of open heart surgery where a patient had undergone a coronary artery bypass surgery and it had proceeded very uneventfully, extremely well. Um, they had closed the chest, the patient was off uh, bypass, no longer needed the heart lung machine. The patient was beginning to open their eyes and beginning to wake up and the surgeon left to go speak with the family. Uh, when the surgeon was gone, the person running the heart lung machine handed a bag of blood from that heart lung machine to the anesthesiology resident, um, could be a registrar in the UK or, or, or other parts of the world, but a learner, somebody who was not a, a consultant, in fact, not even at the specialist level. Um, but at any rate, they put this bag of blood under pressure and the patient went into full cardiac arrest. And only the learner uh, noticed that there was air in the IV line going from the bag of blood all the way into the patient's arm. And he disconnected the bag of blood and everybody in the room at that time noticed on the cardiac monitor that the patient was now in full cardiac arrest. And the question becomes one of, what is that resident now gonna do? Um, because after all, you know, it is, it's the, it's, it's the, uh, the epitome of, of culture, which is to say he's the only one who's seen it. And what is he going to do? And so the question that gets raised is, you know, what are the barriers to a learner speaking up and saying, hey, here's what I think that's going on? And, and, and we'll talk later about the benefits. But what, what might some of those barriers be? The thing that we have to work on as it relates to changing the culture is we have to make the case for the fact that the benefits outweigh the, 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 the barriers to somebody being candid like this. So if you think about in a case like this, just think to yourself, what, what might be uh, some of the benefits uh, related to the resident speaking up? Obviously, the, one of the most obvious ones is, well, you might be able to help the patient. Um, 
particularly since there's a lot of other smart people in the room who know how uh, to manage a case if in fact it's an air embolism. The other benefits are that if, 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 if we don't speak up, we can't figure out really what happened. We can't really understand how did the air get there that in fact wasn't supposed to be there in order uh, to make sure the next patient that comes in uh, to the operating room doesn't have a similar outcome. So there's lots and lots of, of barriers and there's lots of potential benefits to this, but what we've learned out over time, particularly over the last decade, that the benefits do far outweigh uh, the barriers and that we in organizations need to make sure we do everything we can to minimize uh, the potential problems that may be associated with this, the barriers that we spoke about. So you can see uh, this list here comes from again hundreds of of these kinds of talks being given and, and capturing this information from all over uh, and and as as was identified uh, you know, by the by the group here, every one of the issues um, that are barriers are are important ones to consider, a, a, as they have said in that, where you have fears of the legal system, the shame and blame, the reputation, the loss of job, all those things are important. But the benefits are absolutely critical, and and what we've learned, and what organizations need to do, and the power and the value of working through LHSN is how can we do everything possible to help organizations build a culture of trust, um, one that supports patient safety, one that creates a learning environment and mitigates and decreases the likelihood that, that patients and families are going to need to seek any kind of legal recourse through a more comprehensive process. And so um, at, the, at the end of the day, there are many issues that are related to um, uh, candor, um, the, 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 obviously the courage to speak up, to ask for help, um, that there is a, a, a need that the team responds in a crisis, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, as we know, it's, it's all about culture. Um, as it turns out in this particular case, what, what, was, uh, what was nice is that the resident who had been involved in a lot of the training, the patient safety training, had been embraced in a just culture, did have the courage and speak up, um, and explain to those in the room that he did believe the patient had an air embolism. Uh, they were able to to drop the head of the bed, turn the patient on the left side, uh, suck the air out of the heart through the central line that was there, and restore the patient's vital signs. Um, unfortunately, at that moment in time, the patient who had been awake did not wake up, and and because of that, the team called our patient safety hotline from the operating room and we were able to launch the entire candor process as you will see in a moment. Um, and, and, and that becomes a critical part of the learning that, that, that came from this. And we'll go into that in, in more detail. Um, we, along with two other cases, we published this case and again the journal Chest in 2009 with folks from the University of Washington and the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, as well as the Beth Israel Hospital, um, so that folks could learn, uh, again, from what happened to us in ways to consider the potential implementation in their organizations. So how were we able to bring down the wall of silence at the university? Well, it involved a lot of stuff that you see that LHSN has been heavily involved in throughout, which is taking a comprehensive look at the various domains that, that need improvement and getting the leadership and stakeholder buy-in ahead of time before integrating patient safety, risk management, quality, credentialing efforts in the organization. And then we made a decision that we would link this sort of transparency and learning all the way to the, the patient safety education for all the healthcare disciplines. This was a huge project. Um, it took us a year and a half to build it and put it together. Uh, it involved a lot of team training and a lot of the application of just culture principles but our success fully depended upon this being a, a, an area where we had commitment from leadership and all the stakeholders knowing that we needed a better way to approach to patient harm, that the current way we were handling it was not good for patients and families. We weren't learning from the culture of shame and blame and secrecy and that the care professionals also uh, were suffering from the fact that they did not have the ability uh, to get their own internal support for themselves, but also to reach out and, and demonstrate empathy to their patients. Initially, we called this approach the seven pillars. 
a comprehensive approach to adverse patient events. It's what we published in the journal Quality and Safety in Healthcare in 2010. As you can see on this screen, uh, the critical issue is, is reporting events uh, into the system in a multitude of ways and assessment of patient harm where immediately we're able to activate a crisis management team, which includes consideration of the second patient, which is uh, Albert Wu from Hopkins is the person to coin that term. But the second patient is the care professional who's been involved in this harm event. And in fact, in the air embolism case, the second patient clearly is the resident physician who's been involved, who clearly at that time would have been in a panic about what he may or may not have done wrong as it related to, to managing the blood that had been handed to him by the, by the person running the heart-lung machine. Uh, and, and, and in this case, fortunately, the resident did, through the other people in the OR call our hotline, we were able to activate the crisis management team and begin that immediate error investigation. As you can imagine, in this kind of case, the communication piece was extremely complicated. Because as I described, the surgeon had already gone to the family to tell them everything went perfect and their loved ones should be coming back to the ICU with the breathing tube taken out and the patient wide awake. And that wasn't going to happen because after they were able to resuscitate the patient, reanimate the patient, and get the heart rate and blood pressure back, the patient did not wake up right away. And so some very serious conversations had to happen. And fortunately, since the resident had called the hotline, we have a team of people that we establish in all the hospitals that have put the candor process together, the dozens and dozens with whom we've pilot tested these tools, um, there already is a group of people who've been identified super communicators who will be able to help the healthcare team have that kind of difficult conversation while we figure out what it is that happened. And if it turns out that our care was inappropriate, we put those cases in a position where we're able to reach out and do the right thing for the patients and families and provide the appropriate remedy, whatever that might be. Um, it's not always about money. It's not always about, you know, payment in that sort of way because a lot of times what patients and families really want to know is what you see on the right side of the screen, which is we're going to fix things and make sure in a way and redesign things in a way to make sure this doesn't happen again. And so you can see on this screen here five of the seven pillars. Event reporting is one. Error investigation or event investigation is two. Communication immediately after the harm event is three, providing some sort of resolution is four, and of course linking it all to process improvement is five. The other two pillars that we speak to is pillar six, which is education, and pillar seven is data. A big piece of what LHSN is trying to do, which is to get data, get comparative data, get benchmark data so we can track and see what we're doing, how we're doing, how do we compare to other organizations and beginning to do that. The goals of, of this approach, the seven pillars of the candor process, is to help all of us begin to reduce harm through transparency and learning and to reduce the need to activate any kind of legal involvement, whether or not it's going to lawyers, whether or not it's going to the police, whether or not it's, it's filing a lawsuit. It's to try to reduce that kind of legal involvement through early effective communication with all parties so that trust can be maintained between the patients and families and, and the team, the care professional and the institution when these things happen. And that the resolution of these cases should be early, it should be efficient, and it should include things about further prevention of similar events. And importantly, as we like to say, it's, it's also an opportunity, as you can imagine also in this air embolism case, how do we support the patient and family? How do we hug and love them through this unexpected event? And how do we do the same for these care professionals. And, and again, that's what we were able to do in this particular case. We were able to provide support for the resident and support for the patient and family. And fortunately, the day after this event occurred, the um, patient did wake up and uh, the breathing tube was taken out and the patient actually was able to be discharged from the hospital a day earlier than we thought. But more importantly, we learned a ton related to how did that air get in that bag. We had this full investigation and we, we, we learned during that time that there was actually a process, a product defect related to the way 
that the bags of blood were being used with the heart-lung machine, it was a design defect that we were able to fix and change that would not allow the entrainment of that kind of air in future cases. And again, that's one of the reasons why we published this and we wanted to share it immediately so the same thing wouldn't happen to other organizations. That kind of future harm reduction does not occur unless there's the transparency and learning about which we're speaking related to the candor process. And so as you can see here, we built a very sophisticated peer support program for physicians. Uh, in addition to that, we also had the, the peer support program for other people within the organizations. The physicians are treated a little bit differently because at the University of Illinois, uh, where I come from, the physicians are the only group of practitioners who are non-union. The rest of the folks in the organization are union. So within the union, we were able to build in a peer support program, again, for the, for the non-physicians who practice there. Uh, and it's an amazing program, and we have a, a, a group of people who are trained to respond immediately to provide, as you can see at the bottom on the right-hand side there, emotional first aid uh, for the people where, where, where this sort of thing happens. In addition to that, one of our other approaches when we're analyzing the events is to follow a sort of just approach, uh, a fair and accountable approach to, to unsafe events. And this algorithm here is something that we have built in to all of our events that we analyze through the tool that we use that is, um, that is a focus on this. And this is known as, as Reason's Unsafe Acts algorithm. In this case, um, you can follow upper left all the way through um, to the far right that um, uh, the first question you would ask, and we can even think of the resident involved in the air embolism here, uh, did the resident engage in actions uh, d that were intended? In other words, did he intend the air embolism? Certainly not. Uh, moving further to the right, there was no evidence in this resident of illness or, or substance use problems. He did not knowingly violate a safe procedure as you move further along the algorithm. And finally, um, uh, um, does this pass the substitution test? In other words, could someone else have done the same thing? And absolutely, when you look at this and how it occurred, it could have happened to somebody else. And this resident did not have a history of any unsafe acts. In fact, he was an excellent resident. I think he demonstrated that by speaking up when he saw the error. And so you can see in our analysis of this particular case, that turns out to be a blameless error. And so this approach is one, again, that we built into all of our, our, our harm events and our root cause analyses in a way where over and over and over again, we look at the intentions of the people uh, and the behaviors, not necessarily the outcome and, and where they were. Um, and so this is where the systems approach uh, to harm events becomes so important if, again, we're going to become highly reliable uh, organizations. Um, because as the book says, to err is human, and human error will not and cannot ever be eliminated. It is futile to think that that more in-services, more education uh, is, is, is somehow or another going to eliminate human error. Uh, and in trying to focus on that, it misdirects, I believe, our resources and, and where our focus should be. And because the elimination of human error is, 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 is focused on the individual, it leads to the sort of name, blame, shame, and train mentality, and also this issue of, of risk secrecy and collusion because individuals feel like they themselves are, are at major personal risk. And so they often repress and don't document certain things that have happened because the system approach is really about how do we redesign things, not how we redesign humans. Um, because after all, the, the real question is, is to understand what was responsible for what happened, not the who. And then we focus on these systems. And as, as James Reason says, we don't redesign humans, we redesign the system within which humans work. And that is a big part of the, of the candor process of how we begin to do that. When you look at solutions, I think this is an absolutely critical slide to consider. One of the authors is one of our colleagues in creating the candor toolkit in North America, Terry Fairbanks. And in here he talks about how at the lowest level of effectiveness and the lowest likelihood of sustainability is where sort of counseling and discipline end up. Um, we can do tons and tons of counseling and discipline 
but humans will continue to make errors, and so the likelihood of creating high reliability through just that alone is very low, and it's not going to be particularly effective. On the other hand, uh, a higher, more effective approach is doing forcing functions, looking at ways in which the work that gets done gets redesigned in a way where you're designing it for zero harm to the patient. And again, you're using non-human forcing functions, either through your IT system or what have you, to begin to do that. Getting back to the issue of systems and individual accountability, that just culture approach is not one where it's totally blame free. It's actually more one where we try to understand the intentions and the context, and, and we understand when a normal error that happens is one in which we support and we look for system solutions for further prevention. Moving further to at-risk behavior and reckless behavior, those are ones where we need to think about the design systems, but also um, do a little coaching for people who may be engaged in at-risk behavior. And finally, um, reckless behavior is one that in any organization, including one of Just Culture, you need to consider the potential punitive uh, responses. One area I can think of uh, that often comes up as we all know, is it, that's either at risk or reckless behavior that happens every day in our lives um, that kind of gets to this is the whole notion of, of text messaging and driving. You know, and where does that fall? Does that fall in the reckless behavior or does that fall in the at risk behavior? And, and, and again, just think about all the areas in healthcare where we see behaviors that, that are not what we'd want them to be and, and in what category are they going to fall. So we have a couple cases to kind of share um, related to that and, and highlighting this part where we get to the fact that we can't change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which people work. From the non-healthcare related event, I had my own event that happened to me. Um, in fact, I told this story a couple days ago and I had a nurse come up to me and say, oh my God, Tim, you can't imagine this, it actually happened to me as well. And this is something that happened years ago, uh, around New Year's time uh, in North America when I was with my family on a ski trip on New Year's Eve. And I stayed up really late as people are wont to do often on New Year's Eve to celebrate the new year coming in. Uh, but unfortunately for me, I was on call for pediatric anesthesia the next day in Chicago, which was three and a half hours away. So I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and drive to Chicago at a time when I had not too much sleep. And uh, so on my way out to the highway, I stopped and got the biggest, most fantastic cup of coffee uh, at the petrol station and, and as I loaded up with gas. And I jumped back in my car and I'm sipping this wonderful coffee and I'm starting to feel pretty wide awake and I'm driving down the highway and I begin to hear this very rhythmic kind of weird noise, um, the sort of lub-dub, uh, lub-dub. And I think initially that I've had a flat tire and I was going to need to pull over in the middle of the winter uh, in North America and, and change, uh, change a tire. But the car, when I let go of the steering wheel, continued to drive completely straight. And, and I could not figure out where that noise was coming from for, for a bit of time until eventually I looked out the right side, the passenger side of the car, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and to my horror was something that looked like a very long 15-foot gray boa constrictor sticking out of my gas tank because what I had done is I had pulled away with this gas nozzle sticking out of the gas tank. And of course, I see that and I completely panic because I'm driving down the highway. I have no idea whether or not there's going to be a highway patrolman pulling up behind me, pulling me over, asking me what the heck am I doing with this thing sticking out of my gas tank. And so I, I get off at the next exit, kind of like the roundabout. I go all the way around. I head back to the gas station and I'm so humiliated. I just take that thing out and I throw it on the ground and I drive away as fast as I can. And I'm still terrified because in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, I paid with credit card. Do I now have 30,000 US dollars worth of gasoline sitting on the, on the pavement there? But as it turns out, that wasn't the case. And, and when you look at that picture there of those devices, you can see that this kind of mistake happens all the time. And all the gas stations know, all the petrol stations know this could happen. 
So they always keep a spare of these kinds of gas nozzles in the garage so when people like me pull away they can easily replace it. The other thing is because this had happened so many times and there had been bad outcomes, these things got redesigned so there's a shutoff valve. So when you do pull away like that, there isn't a drop of gasoline that goes on the ground. And so all of my fears, all the fantasies I had about the bad things that, that, that may happen to me really weren't those things I need to worry too much about because people had thought about people like me making that kind of normal human error doing that. So when you look at Reason's Unsafe Acts algorithm, this follows just like the air embolism case, which all the way across, I didn't knowingly violate a safe procedure. I sure as heck didn't intend to do this. Anybody else could have done it because they have done it, and I'd never done it before. In fact, I'll never do it in the future. Um, but it is one of those things where blameless error, it didn't feel blameless to me, uh, which is why I didn't tell anybody in my family for over two years because I was so humiliated about doing that. Now moving forward to a healthcare related event. So here's an example where this particular device, many of you will recognize this as a defibrillator, one that is used to shock uh, patients in the event they have a cardiac rhythm uh, that needs to be shocked. And, and those of us, again, involved in this know that shocking the patient quickly is more likely to lead to a normal outcome than waiting to use this device or having problems related to it. But unfortunately, in this particular case, the nurse using this device uh, ran into a problem with it and reported it, uh, the event, because it did not seem to be working the way that it was designed, that when she went to shock the patient, um, the thing turned off. And so she thought it was either a problem that she had or that the device was broken. But when they did the human factors analysis on this event, one of the things that they discovered, particularly now taking this device and putting it in simulation, is something that the way the device is supposed to work is you hit that green button you can see in the picture. You then choose the amount of electricity you need to shock the patient. You then charge it by hitting the yellow button. And then once you've cleared everybody away from the area where the patient is, you shock them. Uh, by pushing the red button. However, what they learned in simulation was that because we're human and because physicians and nurses are often trained that green is good and red is bad, is that in the heat of the moment, when there's a bit of panic, there will be people who once they turn it on and they select the energy and they charge it, when they go to shock the patient, they actually hit the green instead of the red, which shuts the device off unfortunately. And then it takes a significant period of time to reboot and then recharge and be able to shock the patient. What's interesting about this is that in simulation we know that this can happen 10 to 20 percent of the time. The problem is the manufacturer of these devices has not designed them so that if you do hit on, you do select the energy, you do charge it, that if somebody hits that green button, there isn't a warning that comes up and says, oh, wait a minute, are you really sure you want to turn this device off? Um, in the same way that we've designed gas stations, how to, how to handle things a little better doing that. And so a lot of what we need to do in healthcare is to not blame that nurse for hitting the wrong button. It's to understand that as a human, that's going to happen. And how do we redesign devices like this to prevent that sort of thing from occurring and actually harming our patients? And so again, if you look at this unsafe acts algorithm, she fits into the same category that I did as it relates to pulling away from the petrol station, which is to say, uh, this could have happened, it does happen to other people, she doesn't have a history of doing this, and again, this is, this is blameless error. And so when you go back again and you look at the, the whole seven pillars piece of it, and, and you look even at our air embolism case, all seven of the pillars were activated. We supported that resident physician through this. We communicated totally and openly and honestly with the family. We did a, a full event investigation related to this. The remedy related to this problem linked to the process improvements related to the, the, the device that we were using. And of course, we published it to meet the education requirement and we continued to collect data to ensure that that sort of thing, at least from a design standpoint, didn't happen again. So putting this all together, we had a very tragic case at the University of Illinois a few years ago um, and, 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 and this was a case that really led to uh, an, a massive need for the candor process to kick in 
and be able to support this family and learn in a totally different way with a totally different kind of case. Um, as it turns out, a woman by the name of Michelle Melizo Baylog had come to our hospital to have a procedure done under sedation in one of our GI suites. Her parents are on the right side of that picture there that ended up published years ago in the Chicago Tribune. Um, and, and their other daughter is standing next to them looking at her grave. So, so as you can imagine, um, this case involved the death of a healthy 39-year-old patient who was the mother of two little kids um, and, and an important person uh, who lived not too far away from where the hospital was. And unfortunately, what happened in this case is that during the procedure that was going on and the patient had received a lot of sedation, um, the, the nurse who was involved in monitoring her got called out of the room to get a device that was needed urgently to bring back into the room to give to the person doing the procedure. And by the time she got refocused on the patient again, she recognized that the patient had turned blue and was having a seizure. And the code was called, uh, the team came in, it took quite a while, and even mistakes were made during the resuscitation, but eventually they were able to get her, uh, her heart rate and her blood pressure back. But unfortunately, given the amount of time that she had spent without out adequate oxygenation, she ended up brain dead uh, in our hospital, in our intensive care unit. And again, as I said, she was an otherwise healthy 39-year-old woman. The information that we had that proved to us that she did not have enough oxygen for about seven minutes was not part of the medical record. It was only found by someone going through and finding some details and documentation that otherwise would not have been available, uh, interviewing people who otherwise would not have shared their story. And we were able to cross-validate that to come to the conclusion that this woman was now brain dead in our intensive care unit um, because of a multitude of mistakes that we had made uh, with her. And then we had a decision that we had to make, which is, do we follow the candor process, which you've seen? Do we follow the process that we had had agreed upon by our board, by our leadership, by our stakeholders, that when these things happen, we will be open and we will be honest with the families of a patient who is who has who has ended up brain dead as she was. And fortunately, the leadership did not waver. We were given permission to share what it is that had happened to Michelle with her parents, who you see in this picture. And 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 that started a very important resolution process that has gone on for the past many years. I still have a very important relationship going on with them, as you'll see in, in a moment, but it was very important even at that time because, because she was brain dead in our intensive care unit, she was a potential candidate to donate her organs, um, her kidney, her liver, her heart. But we've been told by the legal people that that would not be permissible because in the area where we were uh, active in the hospital there, when you have a death of a healthy outpatient, the coroner, the medical examiner, is going to want the body and all the organs to make sure they do a proper determination of the cause of death. Uh, but in this case, we knew what had happened, and we'd already been honest with the family. We were able to go with the family to the coroner to get them to agree that some of Michelle's organs should be allowed to be used for organ donation. And so Bob Melizo, in the picture on the right, asked whether or not the organs could be direct donated. In other words, could he choose who the recipient of her kidneys would be? And the reason he asked is because his best friend, who was the chief of police where he was the former mayor, was in renal failure and was close to dying at Northwestern Hospital. And so as it turns out, Bob was able to direct donate his daughter's kidney to his friend Marco so that he could be taken off dialysis. And in fact, the procedure went so well that Marco was discharged from the hospital in time to attend Michelle's funeral. And then again, you can see Michelle's picture in that newspaper article. Uh, more importantly, 
we stayed in very close contact with this family. Um, there was no need for any kind of legal intervention. Um, there was a, a, a very rapid resolution to this case that involved making certain that all of her family's financial needs were cared for in a most appropriate way without the family going through the legal system. And we learned a lot from this particular event. I'll share in a minute in terms of process improvements, but we stayed in very close contact with that family over a period of time. And a year later, when we met with the family to talk about the improvements we would made, um, we also offered them an opportunity that they jumped on, which is we invited them to become part of our serious safety event review team at the University of Illinois. So, so what happened, and they're still there even a couple years after I've left, is that you can see Bob in the middle of the picture there and his daughter to his left. They join this medical staff review board which reviews all of our serious safety events and they serve as the conscience of the community to make sure we are focused on improvement in patient care from a patient and family centered standpoint. And for them, it's been very, very meaningful for them, and it's added a great deal of richness to, um, to their lives, and it's allowed them to take a horribly negative event and turn it into something positive. And it's something that I continue to work with the family um, throughout the country. They are a big part of the CANDOR process, uh, the project. They've helped us build the toolkits so that we can focus many of them on making sure they stay patient and family-centered. And it's been an important part of the learning that, that we've gone through at the university and that I've brought even here to the Middle East to think about how, how might we in this completely different culture begin to look at uh, uh, moving a bit in, in this sort of direction. Also importantly, improvements following her case. Um, at the university, there was an immediate change in the way we provide anesthesia coverage for these sedation cases. There was no reason why that nurse should have been in the position she was given the complexity of the case and we certainly could have done more, I could have done more as the chair of our modern sedation committee uh, to have prevented that. We began to use that device that we used to use only in patients with breathing tubes in. We now began to use that device for all sedation cases, even those without a breathing tube in. And I worked with the American Society of Anesthesiologists to establish that capnography is a new standard. Uh, and guideline to be applied for sedation cases and that also worked with accreditation organizations such as the Joint Commission who've now built capnography into the accreditation standards and so the other thing that the Melizo family can feel confident in is because of these new standards just like we saw in 1982 when we had to adopt some new standards then that lives have been saved because of us learning from that event and trying to find ways to as robustly as possible redesign the way we were delivering care in a way that it could be safer. And so quickly running to our data, this is 12 years worth of data. This shows that our number of adverse event reports have gone up logarithmically and we've developed an automated system that allows us to triage and act upon these. This data shows the substantial reduction in the need that patients and families have seen to reach out to the legal system and this has had a massive impact financially and emotionally on the organization and the care providers involved. And, and we've learned a lot from the research we've done and there again, as I mentioned, there's been this task order to create this toolkit that involves assessment tools, event reporting, the event analysis, all the things that you can see mentioned here with our goal being again in September that through LHSN more and more of these very highly developed piloted, validated toolkits we will be making available through uh, LHSN and, and the rest of the folks who are, who are involved with WISH in terms of doing this. So Dee Dee, I'm going to open it up there now for questions, um, if, if folks have any, and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Great. Um, well, as Tim mentioned, we're happy to take a few questions. One that has already come in um, from the audience. Uh, so Tim, what have you found are the main differences in the safety culture between the U.S. and Qatar, in particular thinking about um, the young anesthesiologist um, question that you asked before? Yeah, I think that um, one, of the, one of the issues that, that we need to think about here, and I'm actually working with some medical students at Wild Cornell Medical College, Qatar, as well as some of the residents, is that the hierarchical perceptions are, are, are different here. 
in in Doha versus they are in the U.S. There's a um, there's a there's a perception there's a perceived power gradient that is even bigger here I think for the learner than it is in North America and it, so it is going to be something that as we move forward with a lot of the great work that's working at, that's happening at Hamad a medical uh, corporation is working with their leads of ACGME because they do have a plan to begin to address some of this. The other issue which is really important is the one of particularly for the expat um, who is a learner is the fear that that the that if they don't respond quickly and appropriately and are able to maintain trust that feel of, of deportation the fear of that is real and and so we need to work at the highest levels from a societal and regulatory standpoint all the way down to the local organizations of how do we look at ways to mitigate that fear because if we're going to move forward with a just culture we have to begin to do that and so I think that's again another great reason to be working with WISH it was one of the issues that was brought up during the WISH conferences last year and I think those I think are the are kind of the biggest differences that I see just off the top of my head from from North America and and here in Doha. Great. So um, another question for you, for organizations who may just be beginning on the journey of trying to open up and um, have more candor, where where should they start? Well, I think one of the most powerful and, and valuable ways to begin thinking about this, one would be engaging and making sure that the top leaders of the organization um, uh, are engaged and are and are focused on this particular issue but I would combine with that and I think it's very transformative is patience in the community particularly if you can find patients who have had an experience that perhaps maybe did not go as well as it could have they can often have the most powerful impact on boards and on leadership to help them understand why this sort of stuff is so important. And I think that's why even in the U.S. the use of the TV show 2020 was so powerful because it really put the face on, on patient harm. And I think if you can, you can do that because Didi, what, what we need to do is you got to connect the heart with the head. And you connect the heart with the head by having the patient stories and you connect to the head by helping the leaders understand it there's a massive ROI to the organization based on its reputation even based on finances we see now that if you do this it's in everybody's best interest if you if you move that way so so beginning to connect that heart with the head can help lay the groundworks for for building such a program out Great. I think that um, touches on um, a webinar that we had before from Margaret Murphy, who um, I think the the most touching quote um, that I can recall from that session was, "You ignore at your peril the concerns of a mother," which um, goes back to you know needing to involve the patients themselves and uh, and their families in any sort of initiative around this. Yeah, I fully agree, and I actually know her very well, and she's been one of the inspirations for the Candor Project for us, actually over the years. Great. Well, I realize that we're um, approaching 10 o'clock, so um, there's one final uh, question that we've got in from the audience. Um, regarding the last case mentioned in the Chicago Tribune, you mentioned certain things came to light when people were cross-examined and shared stories they wouldn't have shared otherwise. Who was involved in that process, and were there any difficulties in obtaining the necessary information? Right. So to clarify, the, um, when you use the term cross-examine, you think of a legal proceeding, and that's actually not what we had. Our, part of our process of doing the human factors event analysis includes interviews. And, and one of the benefits of calling the hotline and being able to respond right away, we have teams of people who are trained to be able to get the kind of information one needs to be able to understand that. And that is built within the context of the organization where people can feel safe, people will realize that it's only reckless behavior that which did not occur in that case and people knew no one behaved recklessly. There's a comfort level, there's a trust that people are willing to share with those of us who are doing the interviews to get the answers that we needed to do that. Um, and that's why establishing a just culture approach is absolutely critical when you're going to be able to move forward and you want to create that kind of learning environment. Absolutely. 
Well, I think um, we may have to close the floor to questions now, as um, I think Tim has been quite generous in giving us so much of his time already. So I wanted to say um, a big thank you to Tim uh, for presenting today. Um, here in the UK, this topic is particularly timely, as uh, on Monday, the um, General Medical Council here published new guidance requiring doctors, nurses, and midwives to offer face-to-face -face apologies uh, to patients when errors occur. So as more and more systems move toward open disclosure, um, tools like the Candor Process will just be an invaluable resource. And we're very grateful to Tim for um, sharing it with the LHSN community and uh, looking forward to working uh, with him and all of you to, to share those in the future. So thank you again thanks. to Tim and to uh, everyone for joining. And thank you for the opportunity and thanks to everybody for caring so much about patient safety.